you can do by the okay. twisting oh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, up yeah. and now down and then make it tight. Okay, I got it. So okay. That's good. You're coming back or not right now? I'm coming. Okay. So then I'll, I'll sit back here. Do you have a director's cut thing? <laughs> <laughs> you need that. Right? <laughs> okay. All right, namaste. Namaste. So let's start. Um, last time we kind of talked about a lot of different things about uh, Ganesh Ganapati as a leadership. And uh, we also kind of did a little bit of an, an exercise. We lifted our hand up. And uh, we kind of, so let's start with that, just to get our energies kind of um, back in motion. <laughs> so um, we can just lift our hands up as, as you can. And uh, we're just going to say, uh, and just go ahead and just as you can, open your mouth. Uh, Now we also, you know, in our culture we say oh, right? So let's do the same thing. We're just going to say oh. You don't have to raise your hands, but um, let's just um, close our eyes and uh, we'll say oh. Oh. Right? As loud as you can, just allow your, your voice to carry through. Imagine your, your eyes are closed, you're in a big hall, there are lots of people in the room and it's very loud, but you're trying to call someone on the other side of the room, right? How would your voice be? It wouldn't be, uh, well, you, you'd actually portray your voice, right? So let's actually bring that out. And we're just going to say, okay. We're going to do one more time. This time, um, take a deep breath in. As you breathe in, think of good things. Think of happy thoughts. Think of positive energy. There's energy all around us. Right? There's energy um, from the sunlight, there's energy in the air, there's energy from each other, we're sharing energy from each other as well, right? So let's absorb that in as we breathe in. And we're going to say Om. And as we're breathing out, let's take out all our negative thoughts, things like that. Imagine that going away. If you have any pain in your body, um, rather than avoiding or ignoring that pain, focus on it. Allow your mind to see where that pain is. Pain is a signal. Right? It's a signal from the body going to the mind, to the brain, to say, hey, something is wrong here. So if you're ignoring it, what happens? The pain stays on. What happens when your kids are, are, are hurt and they cry? Okay? Until you ignore them, their cry gets louder and louder and louder because they're trying to get your attention. They want to call you and say, hey, I'm in pain. I got hurt. Okay? It might be nothing, but they got startled. Something went wrong. The moment you give them attention, what happens? What happens to the kids the moment you, your attention goes to them? They calm down. They calm down, okay? So same thing with our body. You may have pain throughout the body that you may be ignoring or you're taking, you know, painkillers and things like that to numb the pain. But the only idea of pain in the body is what? To say, okay, I'm in pain. So it means something is wrong somewhere. And the moment you focus on it, you put your attention on it, then your brain says, oh, okay, I know there's pain here, and it sends chemicals it needs to send. Your body has all the chemicals it needs. It's, it's an own manufacturer to send the chemicals it needs, to send the medicine it needs, to send the healing energy it needs to that area to relax it, to focus on it. And then the, the healing process happens on its own. We're not doing that. There's something going on already automatically, right? So let's keep that in mind. Appreciate that process that we're not in control of. We're not even aware that happens. But it's happening. Okay, it's automatic. Um, our eyes blink how many times a day, right? We don't have to think about it. We're breathing constantly. But what happens with our breath? It's shallow. The moment I say, okay, focus on your breath, what happens? Suddenly you just take a deep breath. Or you might yawn because you realize, you know what? I needed energy. I needed oxygen. And I'm not taking enough in. When you take a deep breath, the oxygen goes through the entire lungs inside your body, right? What happens then? So there's a whole process that's happening simply from the breath that you take in. And you're taking in that energy. So let's do that. And um, we'll do OM. And then we'll continue from there. Okay. So take a deep breath in. energy all around us. Let's share that energy and our thoughts with each other. 
So I'd like to say this is not a teaching or a lecture. It's more of a conversation, a dialogue that we're having with each other. Hello. Thank you. Welcome. Namaste. Sure, of course, no problem. So last time, just to recap from what we talked about, uh, we were talking about Ganapati, right? Ganapati is a leader. So what are the qualities of a leader? And we left off where uh, we were talking about the different parts of the body. Uh, we talked about the ears, the eyes, why the elephant head, right, the stomach. Um, we talked a little bit, but not about the nose, right? So the nose is what? It senses and feels and smells. So as a leader, you want to be able to sense your surroundings. You want to be able to know what's happening in the surroundings around you. So as a leader, you may have other people that are coming to tell you, hey, I heard this, I saw this, okay, or this is what's happening in your neighborhood. Um, we need to be aware of that so we can not only protect ourselves, but are also our families, our environments, and keep it healthy and strong, right? So that's one aspect. It's um, a symbol. And one thing about a symbol, what is a symbol? A symbol is something that in itself may not mean anything, okay? We have a symbol of uh, Sivalinga, right? It's very simple, just a piece of stone and nothing else. There's no shape, no form, nothing. We don't do anything to it. It's just a form. Okay? So what does that mean? When you say Sivalinga, well, lots of big things happen in our mind, right? We have Ganesh. So same thing, you look at the picture of Ganesh or Ganapati, and there's so many thoughts, ideas, stories that come into our mind, into our head, right? So symbols in themselves may not mean that much. But it's the value we put into that object, into that thought, into that idea, into the word. That's the value that we live through, right? And symbols are what? Reminders. So we have a flag, um, flags of every country. And we all learn in school what the flags mean. But when it comes to symbols in our own culture, in our religion, if someone's not teaching that to us, we know only what somebody told us. And they may or may not be true. But these are meanings we incorporate into something. Right? So we're adding value to something that in itself may not mean much. Now to you, you might pick up a flower, and that flower to you has a lot of meaning. Why? Because it was the first flower that somebody gave you that uh, a form of love. Okay? So that flower now has value to you that nobody else has, but to you it means something. Okay? Somebody might get a pencil, and it was the first pencil they got as a gift when they were a child, and from that pencil they became a writer, and you know a storyteller, and they would go on from there. Okay, so that sim that pencil became a symbol for them of progress of so many different things, right? So symbols are something that has value when we give value to them, right? If I gave you a symbol and I said, "Look at this speaker," okay, to you it might not be much, but <coughs> to me, the speaker is how my voice is getting carried to all of you, right? So to me, it may have a great value; to you, it may not. So different symbols have different meanings and values. Why? Because we incorporate that into them. So Ganapati is a symbol that we kind of started with. Um, one of the other symbols, right? So along with Ganapati, what's about the tooth? There's a broken tooth and there's the full tooth of Ganesh, right? So any ideas as to why or do you know the story as to why Ganapati has one broken tooth? Do you know? Okay, that's one story. Okay, um, anything else? Okay, so here's a symbol we look at every day, yet we know very little about the different aspects of that symbol. Right? So uh, one of the stories is Mahabharata, right? Who uh, wrote the Mahabharata? Do we know the name, who it was? Vyas, right? Ved Vyas. So Ved Vyas was writing the Mahabharata. Now, Garbhati was chosen to be the one. You know the story, right? How about you tell us? Yes. Right. So um, the, the idea behind that was, okay, so Garbhati is going to write. Ved Vyas is going to say the story okay, of Mahabharata. But Ved Vyas said, okay, but there's a condition. All right? um, I'm going to continue to talk non-stop, okay? You have to continue to write. Namaste. Thank you.
Okay? So, uh, Vedya said, okay, I'm one condition. Okay, I will not stop. So you have to continue to write. All right? So, uh, Garpati, you know, in those days, they're writing with a felt uh, feather pen. And, okay, it broke. Now what? Okay, if I stop writing, Vedvyas will stop saying. Okay, we won't get the Mahabharata. What happens now? So he broke his, his tusk and started writing with that. Okay, so that's the story aspect of it. And the condition, by the way, do you know the story why uh, Ganpati has a broken tooth? Not, uh, not exactly. Okay. What do you know about it? I mean, I know the religious story. Yeah, go ahead. That's the... The religious story was like he was writing and all of a sudden he got, I mean, that pen got broke. Yeah. So he could, he cannot stop by writing. So he just uh, broke his teeth and used that as a pen. Right. That's the religious part. Yes. Okay. So exactly it, right? So that's the story we all know about, that um, he could not stop while he's writing, otherwise Vedvyas would not continue uh, saying the Mahabharata. So he broke his tusk to continue writing. Now, we understand this part, but the other part, the other condition was Vedvyas said, uh, I will continue to uh, speak and you have to continue writing, but you have to understand everything I say before you write it. Okay? That was kind of smart on Vedvyas's part because if you're constantly talking, Mahabharata is very long, right? You need to take breath, you need to kind of pace yourself. So it gave Vedya some time because now Ganapati couldn't just write whatever. Okay? He needed to understand what he's writing before he writes it. So it kind of slows him down a little bit. And it gives Vedya time to kind of take his breath and, and speak to Mahabharata. So uh, an aspect of this, of this symbol is understanding. Being able to know what you're doing before you do it. Right? That's something that's great at teaching in terms of the symbol itself. What is the Ganapati symbol teaching us? Right? It only has meaning if we know what, it, what we are putting into it. Okay? If I look at Ganesh symbol every day, I pray to it, we do pujas, right? Um, the story is anything we do in our life, first thing we do, we pray to Ganesh, right? But most of the time, we don't know why we do it. We do it because, oh, that's what everybody does. So I should do it. That's the tradition. We have to follow this tradition, right? Who says that? Oh, our ancestors say that. Oh, all these uh, rishis, and, and if, if rishis are saying this, it must be true, it must be good, I got to follow it. That's good as a, as a student, okay? When you're a child, like right now, if she wants something, she's going to go to mommy, right? So there was a question that last time somebody posted, and there was a great question, like you mentioned last time, that, you know, um, it's great to understand something and then do it, right? To learn and then follow. But as kids, um, you cannot expect kids to understand everything, Right? So as kids, we tell the kids, here, you need to do this. You need to take this step. You need to follow it this way. And as a child, they're going to follow and they're going to do it. Not because they understand it, but because mommy and daddy said so. Right? Um, they don't have their thought process developed fully yet. And as a child, that's okay. okay. We want that because it's in a protected environment. We're doing it for the betterment of the child. You know, uh, we want to protect the child. So if the child is kind of trying to balance on top of this table, it's dangerous. So we're going to say, no, don't do that. And we're going to punish the child if the child continues to do that. So that's great. Okay? So same thing in our culture, in our religion. We have lots of text. We have lots of great wisdom and knowledge. But what good is this knowledge if we don't understand it? Okay? So as a child, yes, we should follow what our teachers are telling us, what our gurus teach us. Okay? Follow it because if they say, okay, do japa, okay? and you do japa for five minutes every day in the morning, okay, I'll follow it. Why? I don't know, but I'll find out as I go. But I trust my guru. He's giving me something to do. I'll do it because I trust my guru. So as a student, that's great. As you mature as a student, your next step should be, why should I do this? Is it helping me? What am I getting from this? Right? Now, you look at uh, a child like her age, four, five, three years old, versus a child in high school. Okay? Try to tell a high school child, I want you to do this. What's the first thing they're going to say? Why? Right? They're going to say, why? Why should I do it? They want to know. They're curious. Our minds... As an adult, what happens? We went through the same process when we were young. Now we get older, and what happens? That why is forgotten. Okay, we're in a routine, we just do it. Okay, so we've got it to a point where we just follow. 
Everybody's doing this, I gotta do it. Okay? We don't wanna do that. Because by doing that, if everybody falls down the cliff, our future is what? Falling down the cliff. So we need to kind of see for ourselves. We need to, we have eyes. We have eyes, we have a mind, we have an intellect. And we talked about last time that Ganapati's head was cut off. Okay? So we know the story. Oh, Sivagvan came, wanted to go inside. Ganapati said, no. Okay? You cannot go inside. Now, Sivagvan knows this is my home. Ganapati has never met Sivagvan. Doesn't know that's his father. So he said, no. His mom told him, you're not allowed inside. Okay? Don't let anybody in. So that's what he does. Never thought to question, who are you? Why are you here? Um, you know, my mom is taking a bath. If you want to wait, I'll let her know. And then once he's ready, you can come inside. None of that happened. So Sivagvan cut the head off. Now, the question in our mind should arise, okay, that's a story that's great for kids. But Sivagvan, we say he's Bhagwan, he's, he's God. So if Siv is God, then God knows everything. He's almighty, he's everywhere, he's omnipotent, omnipresent, right? We have all these meanings and words what is the value of those words if we don't think about it, if we don't understand it? Now, this way, if you think about it, oh, wait a minute, he's Bhagwan. He knew that's his son. He's, he's all-knowing. That means he knew that mom said to him, don't let anybody in. So Sri Bhagwan knowingly still cut the head off. So there must be a reason why he did that. So does anybody think of this? Why do we think Sri Bhagwan would do that? What do you think? We know the story, right? We know we know this is what happened. But why would Sri Bhagavan cut the head off? Uh, there should be some reason that uh, the elephant uh, was born. Uh, if the elephant was born, uh, like as it is, uh, it was expecting to be with Shiv Bhagavan. Okay. So then, uh, uh, in such a way, it happened. Like, Okay, so we have lots of different stories that come out, but the meaning is forgotten, right? We think this is the story, it must be true, we tell each other stories. Stories are great to help us remind us, because stories are easy to remember, right? Symbol, one little symbol, we talked about symbol of uh, the McDonald's M, right? That one symbol, M, that's all. They just need to flash it for 10 seconds, 2 seconds, but we all know that symbol. And it has value to us. Oh, I remember going to McDonald's when I was a kid. I remember having French fries there. Oh, I can still smell those fries now, right? So symbol has so much value once you know what it is. But our own culture, our own tradition, our own symbols, we have so many. We know the stories and we forgot the meanings, okay? So we, we should continue to ask why, okay? We're like the teenagers. We should ask. Our minds are young. Once we know why, if I can explain to you, you know what? If you do this, this, and this, you're going to get this. Now there's a result attached to it, okay? I have this goal. If I achieve this goal, I'm going to get a degree, I'll have a job, things like that. So there are goals that are there. Now the symbol, Ganesh, right? So at that time, they knew elephants, animals. Elephant happened to be one of the intelligent animals during that time period, and it was understood and known, right? So the idea is, Sivagwan is saying that, look, if you don't use your head, you're going to lose it. Law of nature. You use it or you lose it, right? So this is one aspect. Now, as a symbol, we should start to question and understand. What are these symbols? What do they mean? And now, can I incorporate it into my life? Okay? So as students, yes, follow what we're taught. Do as our gurus are teaching. Then start asking questions. Is this helping me? Why am I doing this? And there's so much more knowledge and wisdom we can gain out of practicing. Okay, so practice comes into play. If you don't understand it, continue to follow because you trust. But as you're doing, you begin to get experiences, and those experiences is what validates to yourself. Uh, yes, you know what? Doing japa is helping me focus. Okay? How easy it is for me to look at that red bowl over there, or to look at this, or to look at anything. Okay? Or just stare at this one point. How long can we do it? It's hard for us to focus in one idea, or one thought or one anything, right? We can do it for a second, 10 seconds, 10 minutes, some people longer, an hour, right? But that takes practice. The more you do it, the better you get. And there's a lot of clutter that goes on in our minds. Now, we have uh, in our culture, in our uh, you know, books and scriptures, we talk about smruti and shruti, 
right? So smruti and sruti. Um, has anyone heard what, what those words are or what they mean? Smruti means to hear. So which one? Smruti. Smruti. Smruti, okay. Smruti, remember. Okay, very good. Okay, so sruti is, say it again. Smruti, listening. Listening. And smruti? Remembering, okay. So from our uh, scriptures, what is Shruti and what is, can you give me some examples? Like for example, our Vedas, our Upanishads, what would they be considered as? They are Smritis. Smriti is remembering, right? Okay, so it is a remembering or is it something somebody heard? <laughs> heard. Heard. Very good, right? So, um, Vedas is divine wisdom. It was heard, right? Uh, it was heard and written down. So that's divine wisdom coming to us from God direct to mankind, to men. And it was written down. And that text, those Vedas, are divine knowledge, right? So we call that, can you say it again? Sruti. <coughs> so we openly said, these are all things that are divine knowledge, divine wisdom that came to us. It was heard, right? Now, we have Smriti. Smriti is... Remember. So things that you remember and you write down, those are smriti. Right? So we have all these great epics, Ramayana, Mahabharat. Those are epics that we talk about, we remember. Those are stories that we heard and I remember. And now I'm writing it and we're talking and discussing this. So we have these different kinds of text and they have values in them. So if there's Vedas, which we say is, is heard, right? It was heard and it was now taught to us. That's divine wisdom. Every word there has so much value and meaning because it was divine. God directly spoke these words. Now, if I say something, it might take me a whole hour or it might take me an entire paragraph to kind of explain one thought, one idea. When God does it, one verse, one word. Then there's Upanishad. Upanishad, it tries to explain that one verse. And it, and it takes an entire text to kind of break down each syllable of that verse and try to explain to us what does it mean. So something, a concept, an idea, a symbol, one little symbol, okay? Once I know what it means, it's a reminder to me, okay? Why does McDonald's put that symbol in commercials? It's a reminder, oh, you know what? I love the fries they have there. I may not have been thinking about it at all the entire day. The moment I see that symbol, I want to go to McDonald's right now. Okay? So, Ganapati, Siv, Sankar, right? Ram, Sita, Lakshman. We have all these great stories. The moment I see that symbol, it should remind me. You know what? I should follow in their footsteps. I should do as they do. Look at Hanuman. We have stories for kids, right? So, these stories are important because they teach values. There's something to learn from them. But once you do that, now we need to begin to practice it in our own life. Okay, what's the point of learning something if I'm not going to apply it? Okay, I can have a PhD in how to play basketball, but I have no knowledge of playing basketball. I need to pick the ball up and shoot it in the basket. The moment I pick the ball up and shoot it in the basket, that's where my true learning begins. Right? Until then, it's all just theory in my head. I have no knowledge of practicality. Once I do that, now I'm beginning to really learn. So all the schooling is great, all the talk is great, but I need to be able to apply it into my life. Once I begin to apply these principles and values into my life, into my choices, then my true learning begins. Once I'm starting to learn, now I can understand for myself, and now it's automatic. I don't have to think about doing it, I just start doing it. Why? Because it makes sense to me. Okay? I don't have to force you to pray every morning. I can just do it because I know the effect it's having on my life and it's a practical one, it's a real one. It's a benefit that I see it for myself, right? So, uh, any questions or any other ideas or thoughts? I like to do this as a dialogue where it's not just a teaching or a, or a discourse. It's a dialogue, a conversation with each other because we all have something that we can learn from each other. Any other comments, thoughts? Why Shivji? Shivji knows everything then. Why? Yes. Good question, right? So Shivji knew this, so why would he cut his own son's head off, right? So it's, um, so this is a story. Did it really happen, right? Um, was Shivji in a mountain? 
and then uh, Ganesh was a real person. Yeah, possible. We don't know. We weren't there, right? But the idea is what? That our intellect is an important, valuable thing. That our head, our intelligence is very valuable. So if we're not using it, if we don't question as to what's happening, why is it happening, who are you, why do you want to go inside, Ganesh didn't ask these questions. It means he wasn't using his intellect. Okay? If you're using your intellect, that makes sense. Okay? Then the story would be very different. Oh, you're my dad? I didn't know that. Okay, hold on, let me tell mom you're here. Okay? The whole story changes. And how long did that take? Just simply asking, who are you? Didn't happen. In the story, it doesn't happen. Right? So Siv Bhagavan wants to teach a lesson. He wants to say, so whoever came up with this story, it's a dialogue to remind each other that, you know what? Our intelligence is very important. Okay? So it's a gift. It's a gift that we have. And when we talk about gifts, what else is a gift? This moment right now is a gift to us. Right? There's a past. Do we have control over what happened in the past? No. The future. Am I in the future right now? No. Right? Do I have control over the future? No. What do I have control over? The now present moment. Okay? This moment is the only moment that I can control. The choices I make right now will affect the future and also the past. Now think about that. How is it affecting the past? It's already done. It's already gone. But what's different? What's different is I learned something now that changed the way I think of everything. Because I change the way I think and understand, my past has a different meaning. Something that happened in the past has a different meaning now. Okay? Maybe I fell down yesterday and I broke my leg. But you know what? Now that I'm looking at it today, I met someone that I would have never met if my leg didn't break. And that one person might have become my life partner. The whole value of that leg breaking changed. Right? So the past changes. Why? Because we change. And where is that change happening? It's not out there. Okay? I'm not here to change anybody. I'm here to change myself. Once I realize that, nothing else matters. What matters is what's real to me. And that reality changes every moment I change myself. Because I see things differently. And that's our third eye, right? Sivagon, we say he has a third eye. Trinetra. What is that third eye? And the third eye is the eye of what? What do we say third eye is representing? Wisdom. Wisdom, okay. Awareness, Awareness right? What do we say when he opens the third eye? What's happening? When does he open his third eye? What happens? When mother was born, when he's very angry, right? And what happens when he's very angry and the third eye opens? Everything got burned. Everything got burned. Destruction, right? So there's destruction of what? The whole world just gets burned and destroyed. What is that destruction? We say, just before we talked about that, you said the third eye represents what? Wisdom. Knowledge, right? So how can wisdom and knowledge be a result of destruction? Destruction, we look at it as a negative thing, as a bad thing. Okay? My house burned down. Oh my God, that's bad. How could God do this to me? But what is it, what is it destroying? The new, no, the new thing is coming out. The new thing is new okay, so that's one way to look at it. When there's destruction, there's also a new beginning. So that's one aspect. But what is it that's getting destroyed? Now, if you say the eye represents knowledge and wisdom, then when that eye opens... What is he sharing with you? That knowledge and wisdom. And so what got destroyed in you? Your ignorance. Right? So you went from ignorance to bliss within a moment, a blink of an eye. All he had to do is open his eye, one blink, you're now knowledge wise, you're open. Right? So what is it that's getting destroyed? It's our ignorance. So every moment you're living your life, every moment you're breathing, you're thinking, you're doing something, now, action, right? Karma, karma yoga. We talk about karma yoga, bhakti yoga. Karma is action. Now, can anyone here say that there's a moment where I'm not doing anything? Can you think of a, a time that you say I'm doing nothing? Is there a moment like that? Maybe we meditate. No. Okay. Then it takes our mind and our life. Okay. Sometimes, maybe 
fractional seconds, we may lose all the consciousness regarding body, senses, and that. Okay, so that's one aspect. But if you think of action, what is action? Right? Action means there's something happening. There's a change from one moment to another moment. And that change is an action. Right? So if I move, I'm acting. If I'm moving my hands, that's acting. But what about thinking? Is thought an act? Thought is an act. Okay? Thinking means I am doing something. So I am thinking, okay, that means it is a, an act. So even the word itself, thinking, means there's, your, there's a supposition that I am acting. Okay? So even a thought is an act. So there's no moment in our life where we are not acting. So action is not an option. That's part of the way we were made. So what is an option? Okay, I know I have to act. I must act. But what is the choice I have? What act will I take? What will I think about? How will I think about it? What will my next step be? Okay, do I want to go this way or do I want to go that way? Do I want to go straight? Do I want to jump up? Do I want to bend down? Those I have options. Okay, so my only option is what action do I want to do? And in order to know what action I want to do, okay, what's going to help me? What are the tools I can use to decide on the action I will take? That requires some kind of education, right? If I want to build a building, am I an architect? Am I an engineer? Am I a plumber? Am I an electrician? So I need all of these different practices, experts in these different fields, to actually come up with a building, right? So any action I want to do requires some kind of skills, some thought, right? So it starts with a thought. So thought starts the whole process of any other action. So that's a beginning. But now, what do I need to do? I need to learn. And learning happens where? Does it happen outside? Does it happen, if I want to learn, is it happening in you? Or is it be happening in me? In myself. Right. So if you want change, I want to change the world. I'm going to go around and change the whole world. Okay? If anybody doesn't like what I want, I'll destroy it. Change happens inside myself. Right? I cannot force somebody else. I can, you know, a young child, I might be able to force them while I'm there in front of them and I can fear them into doing something. The moment I leave the room, do you think they're going to do what I was telling them? No. They'll continue what they were doing before. Right? So, force can be a temporary action. But if I actually want something progressive, something real, then it has to happen inside myself. And that's a choice. That's a decision. Once I realize that, you know what, there's something in me I need to change, then change can begin. And how did that start with the thought? So anything we do, if we start with this idea that, you know what, there's something more than me. There's something greater than myself. And I don't know what it is. But I know I'm not perfect. I need to change. Once I have that realization, then the rest, God helps. Okay, and we have all the symbols, all the great traditions, all the scriptures. We have Sruti, we have Sruti, right? We have gurus who understand this knowledge and wisdom, and we listen to them. But the next thing needs to be, I need to follow in that footstep. Once I start to practice it, now it becomes real in my life. And once it becomes real in my life, it's not in a practice, it's not forced. I just automatically do it, okay? We brush our teeth every day. Why? Oh, I'm lazy today, I don't want to brush my teeth. Well, why do we do it? Because I know if I don't, there are germs in my mouth, and I don't want that to continue. So we've been ingrained, we've been trained when we were young that I want to do this because there's a benefit to it. So same thing, prayer. Why do we do prayer? Why do we do japa? Why do we do meditation or yoga or anything else? Okay? These are all different aspects of ourself. As a human being, I'm not just a body. I'm not just a mind, right? I'm not just one or another. I'm a combination of many things. And much of what I am is not a thing at all. Okay, and we talked about a little bit about maya. Maya is an illusion. So this whole world is an illusion. Why do we say that? Okay, is it really an illusion? And it's an illusion to who? We talk about, okay, what do you see? Okay, I gave this example last time that... If I ask you, what do you see, okay, you can describe it to me, 
But I'm going to say, no, you're all making that up. There's no way you see all of that. Can be true. Why? What am I looking at? I'm looking at this. So if I only have one perspective, and if I say that one perspective is the only truth there is, guess what? That's a flaw in my thinking, not in the flaw of reality, right? Somebody who's sitting on the corner might only see this part of what I'm showing, okay? So if you're seeing this, then all you see is that reality. So depending on the angle you're looking, depending on what you're looking at, reality for you changed. So did the reality really change or your perspective changed? Perspective changed, right? You broadened your perspective. So which means what? Your mind needed to be an open mind, right? So if your mind is open, then there's learning that can happen. But if your mind is closed and you say, I know reality, I know what I see, and I trust my, what my senses, okay? My senses are not going to let me down. My eyes are perfect, 20-20 wisdom. I could see everything clearly. So because I can see everything clearly, I have 20-20, my doctor said my eyes are great. Okay? So whatever I'm looking at is perfectly the way it is. Is it really? No. Okay? We look at animals. Animals see things differently than we do. What about bats? They can see in the dark. Are they really seeing? There's a different technique that they're using to be able to move around where they are. But the vision that they see is not the vision that we see. A person that's colorblind might not see the color red. Okay? That has to do with the structure of the eye itself. And something might be off. But their world is very different than the world I see. Somebody that's totally blind, their world is very different. They have a higher sense of hearing. They could hear things that I don't. What about dogs? Dogs can sense somebody coming a mile away. How is that happening? So it's the same world. We all live in the same world, but we see things differently. We see things very differently from each other. And that sight is a reality on the way I'm thinking, the way I'm observing. So if I know that this is the only reality there is, then that's my flaw. That's something I'm missing out on the rest of the world, right? So the more I open myself to learning, and I say, I don't know everything. That's a realization has to happen inside ourselves. Once we do that, now I'm open to learning. Okay, if I say I know everything, then there's nothing to be taught. I know everything, so my mind is closed. If my mind is closed, you have a cup full of water, and you go to somebody and say, can you fill this water up? Can you fill up more water in there? What happens? The water spills out. It's not going to go anything. Everything spills out. Why? Because it's already full. So if I go with an empty mind, does that mean I know nothing? I know something, but I don't know everything. And that's a wise person. A wise person never says, I know everything. A wise person says, I know nothing. Okay? There's a whole world of knowledge to be gained from that. We looked at, uh, last time in our youth class, in our uh, Gita class, we talked about what is real, what is not real. Right? You remember that? Can you tell me about it? Talked about uh, Arjuna asked Krishna, um, um, which uh, which um, which type of, uh, which uh, which he should do, um, should he think everyone, everything is an illusion, or he should just um, take his mind, um, put his mind on Krishna and worry about nothing else? Okay, so in our youth class, thank you, thank you. We were talking about uh, Gita, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, and we we're looking at reading verses 1, 2, 3, right? Where did we leave off at? At number 3? Okay. So there's a conversation Arjuna is having with Krishna Bhagavan that, you know, who is the greatest, what is the best? Now, I'm not going to repeat that part, but the, the question, the idea, the concept is, you know, there are a group of people that will say, this whole world is Maya, it's an illusion. Okay. So if we look at that, you look at a molecule, a cell, any wooden piece, any structure, okay? When you actually look at it, it consists, it consists of a nucleus, right? It has some uh, electrons and protons and things like that. 
Now, what's between that electron that's spinning and the actual nucleus? Empty space, right? But if you have a yo-yo and you start spinning yo-yo really fast, what happens? What do you see? You see a big circle, right? And if you try to touch it with someone spinning it really fast, will it hurt you? Yeah. It will, right? And does it matter where you put your hand? No. Why? Because it's spinning so fast, it looks like it's a solid. And so, the illusion is, it's a solid. It's really not. Uh, Deepak Chopra had a statement, he said, all of this reality is 99.9999% empty space. And that's a physics, right? So that scientists that are looking at this, saying this. So if it's all empty space, then what's real? Okay? We're, our bodies are all made of this, and so our eye is looking at this, is programmed to see what we're looking at. But that's not the full reality. So what is real? And so there's a group of people that will say, all of this is Maya, and so why should I focus my attention on that? And so we have, can you remember? We had a Bhakti Yoga and, do you know what the other one was? We kind of started talking about it, we didn't really do too much of it yet. Okay, so that other aspect, the people that follow in this tradition is Gnan Yoga, right? So they want to go with the basis of learning, educating themselves, what is true, what is real, and everything else is not real, I don't want to focus on it. And that's a very difficult path to follow, okay? Because, yeah, it's not real, but if a bug bites you, do you feel it? So the moment you get a bug bite, yeah, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real, you're still gonna cry, you're still gonna feel pain, okay? So it's hard to follow that path. The other path is Bhakti Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga talks about love, right? Now, we had an example last time about what? Do you remember? The iPhone. Yeah. And Go ahead. Exactly, right? So if there's something that you really love, for the kids, the iPhone is something you love a lot, okay? So if your parents said to you, you know what, I'll give you a gift, I'll give you the iPhone that you really want, but I need the room cleaned in two hours, okay? Is anything going to matter to you? You might be hungry, you didn't have lunch, you didn't have dinner yet, okay, you just got home, you didn't play your games yet, you didn't do anything. Your friends are calling you, hey, come on over, we're going to watch a movie. Or is that anything important to you at that time? No. Where's your focus? Uh, on the iPhone. Okay? So, focus is on Krishna, Bhakti Yoga. Everything you do revolves around Krishna, Bhakti Yoga. It's out of love. <coughs> and when you're doing something out of love, the whole world changes. Things that you think you like, your priorities change. Right? We talk about gopiyas. Gopiyas, everything they did. They were cooking, they're singing God's praise. Okay? They're walking down the street, they're thinking of God. Okay? They're dancing, I'm dancing with Krishna Bhagavan, Krishna Lila, right? So these are stories that we hear, but in our practical life, what happens? Our kids, iPhone, oh, I want the iPhone. They do anything for the iPhone. So what's happening to the mind? All right? You might have been given the best food in the world at that time that your mom cooked for you and you said, you know what, mom, I really love this, can you cook this for me? And it's right in front of you. But I need that iPhone. Is that food now important to you? No. So, what happened? The food that you really loved, you waited a whole week for mom to make it, now it's in front of you, nice and hot, and you can smell it, it's right there, all you need to do is eat it. But, no, I gotta get my room cleaned, right? So your focus changes. Why? Because it's out of love. And so that's an easier path. Okay? You didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to do anything particular. Everything you're doing now becomes an act towards gaining that. So anything you do for Krishna Bhagavan now becomes a selfless act. It's not now, yes, iPhone, I did it because I wanted it. When I'm doing something for Krishna Bhagavan, okay, is it something, now if you did something for your mom, right? Your mom needed something, you know she really loves this. What are you going to do? You're going to give it to her as a gift. You might surprise her. Are you thinking of yourself or are you thinking of mom? Yourself. 
So if you know your mom needs something and she really wants it and you want to give it to her as a gift, okay, you're going to go out of your way to go figure out how to get it. Right? You're going to look for a way to wrap it, to hide it from her. But are you thinking of yourself or are you thinking of mom and what she likes? Mom, right? So when you love something, when you love someone, everything you do now gets revolved around that. And so my entire life becomes a life of bhakti yoga, right? Now, bhakti yoga is one aspect. Gnana yoga is another aspect. Does it mean that, well, I have to choose one or the other? Well, can you do bhakti? Can you love someone without knowing that? No. So knowing is a part of it. Now, in the act of doing, you learn more. Okay? You live with your mom. So you learn and you're doing an everyday thing. So that love is ingrained. It's coming through automatically. But at the same time, you also learn about your mom. right? So if you love something, if you love someone, you want to know everything about them. You want to do whatever you can to please them because you know that I love them. So, and where is this God? Where is this Krishna? It's not out there. Okay? He's right here. We do namaste. So these are all things in our culture that we do. What is namaste? Can you tell me? What is, why do we say namaste to each other? Okay. Um, and if we bend to somebody, it, it feels like um, uh, like uh, our ego is uh, is put down. Like when we do uh, nam- namaste, mm-hmm. like our ego yeah. is bent down. Okay. Very good. Anything else? Did you say namaste to anybody? Mm-hmm. Okay. Why? Why? Do you get your blessings? Okay. Anybody else? How, why would you say namaste to somebody? I am giving respect to the God who is in you. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Like here, we say hand, right? In our culture, we do namaste. What would you say? Why would you do namaste? To give respect to Okay. How about you? What do you think? To give them respect and give them greetings. Like how we say in each other or Right. Very good. Okay, all great answers. And it's taken to the point that, well, okay, I'm buying down to somebody else. Okay? Now, one of uh, another uh, group I was talking to, um, this person really had a very strong point that, you know, why should I bow to another human being? Okay? They're human just like I'm human. I'm a man, he's a man, okay, woman, doesn't matter. But why should I put my head down to somebody else? To God, I understand. Okay? If I believe in God, I don't believe in God. But if I believe in God, I want to bow down to God. Okay. But why to another human being? Okay? And we gave some answers that we want to respect them. We're saying, we're buying down to the God within the person. Right? So God is within all of us. In myself. Right? So that should lead us to thinking in a practical way. That, okay, if God is within myself, then... What do we call a place where God lives? Temple. temple. Exactly. Right? So we do we go to temples? Churches? Mosque? Masjid? Right? Place where God dwells. How about ourself? Our own body? Is it a temple? Do we think of it that way? No. But is it? Okay. So how did I go from you saying no to yes, within a second. Because you said that um, God is in you, so and God um, lives in every human being. Yes. So, um, so we are a temple because God lives in us and God lives in the temple. Exactly, right? So temple is a place where God lives. Okay, so great. Now before a second ago, we thought, no, we go to temples, okay, there's God within each of us. So that should lead us to the next step. Okay, that means God is within myself. So if that's true, then that means this body is a temple. Now when we go to a temple, is it clean? Okay. Do we keep dirt in there? How about our bodies? Do we put dirt inside our bodies? Do we eat junk food? We love junk food, right? Tastes great. Okay. So we put that in our body. 
How about all the clutter of things that we hear? Stories of people, the news we hear, all the different things, gossip, okay? Do we allow that to go into ourselves? We do, right? So, we talked about Ganapati as a symbol. Now let's put that together. Ganapati, yes, listen to everything that's around you. You need to be aware. But then, as a true leader, what does a leader do? Leader is able to filter that information, right? Do we use filters in our home for water? Why? We want to keep the dirt away and get the pure water. We want to keep our body clean, our environment clean, right? So thinking good is great, but that should result into an action. And that action should be good. Why? Because that action is good, that means the result will be good. And if I have an environment in a temple, it's a great environment where our goal is the same. What happens in our home? What happens in our own body? When we sit down and we talk of meditation, close your eyes, what happens? Do you just have one thought? One thought leads to another, that leads to another, that reminds you a story that you had with somebody else five years ago, that reminds you of an experience you had 10 years back. And so our mind is constantly jumping from one to another to another. And did that take time? Happens within seconds. I can be in India, and two seconds later, I'm in Mars or Venus, or I'm going into a galaxy far, far away. And that reminds me of a movie I saw, right? And I'm talking about time and space. And then it reminds me of a friend I was talking to who had an argument with me, and we had a heated discussion. And all these things, feelings, our body chemicals change as well. So I could be sitting in one place quietly, nobody knows what's happening inside my mind, but there's a whole entire chemical reaction happening from where I'm going from happiness to another moment sadness, to another moment anger, depression, right? Happiness, joy, bliss. So our goal is there, but within moments, we jump not only in our thought process, but also in our own chemical reaction that's happening. We could be sweating. Somebody could walk by and say, you're just sitting there, are you okay? Do you need to go to a doctor? Do you need medicine? Right, what's happening? How's that happening? Simply by your thought process. Now what if we could control that thought process? Okay, so we look at the, the rays of the sun, right? So we have sunlight. We stand outside when it's nice and sunny, we get that warmth, we get a good feeling, right? So that's great. We get the light that feels good, looks good. We try to replicate it indoors as well, right? We try to get sunlight inside. Now, what happens when you take a magnifying glass and you focus that sunlight? What can you do with it? What happens if you take magnifying glass and you point it at something with, with the sunlight? Um, like if you point it at a leaf, like a dry leaf, it's gonna, a fire can start. Right. So it's the same sunlight, but what happened to it? Okay, how? By the magnifying glass. So magnifying glass, what did it do? It collects. Right. Okay, so the magnifying glass focused that sunlight. It's the same light, the same energy that's all around us constantly. But the moment I put a magnifying glass and aimed it at something, wherever I aim it, what's it doing? It's taking that same energy but intensifying, magnifying it. Okay? So it's sharpening that same energy into a point. So when we talk about meditation, we talk about yoga, right? What is it we're trying to do? When you sit down to say, okay, let's have a quiet moment. A thousand thoughts can go on within a moment, within a second. And emotions give reactions within our body that are real, that are practical. A scientist can test and observe and analyze, right? We can get those reactions, right? Just by changing our thoughts. But that's not happening in our control, okay? One thought leads to another to another. What if we could focus that like a magnifying glass into a single point, to a single thought? What kind of effect do you think that can have? Powerful, right? And so what happens if we can teach our kids this type of technique? How powerful do you think our kids will be? How about ourself? Can a blind man lead a blind man? Maybe, but hard, right? So, as parents, 
or as gurus or as teachers, okay, if we have this knowledge and wisdom, then we can share that and we can fine tune our kids, our neighborhoods, our communities, right? So one can lead to the other, but it has to start where? Outside? Inside. Inside. Exactly. Right? So it has to start within ourselves. If I can realize this, then I can lead my own choice. And so, I don't have a choice on acting or not acting, but I do have a choice on what action should I take. And that action, where will it lead? By this, by this understanding, I went from saying, this is not my temple, to, yep, this body is a temple, because God lives here. And so, there should be divinity within me, myself. And if that's true, what does that mean? That means I'm divine myself. And so, how can I lead my life to be a divine life? Now, that's the real experience. That's the reality that you experience within yourself. No one can experience that same thing. That's a personal connection between you and the divine. Right? And that personal connection between you and the divine is now what's leading your life. And so your life goes from selfish, protective, okay, because, well, I know I have this, I have this. I need to protect myself, okay? I need to do things for me because no one else will do it. I go from thinking this way to now thinking, what can I do for the world? Or what can I do that God wants me to do? And so I go from selfishness to selfless work. Selfless work is out of love. It's a bhakti yoga. And so in Gita chapter 12, Krishna Bhagavan is answering to Arjun that bhakti yoga is a preferred way. That just does not mean that non yoga is not loved by Krishna Bhagavan. It's a more difficult path. But ultimately, even non yoga will lead to the same goal. Krishna. Right? But it has to start within ourselves as an action. And when that moment builds up, now we have that focal point. And that strength will be the strength that leads the rest of the world, ourselves. Okay? So uh, I would like to open this up and to continue this to say, whatever we do, we need to not look out there and blame and point, but look in myself. If I can change myself to be a better person, then the world around me will automatically start to change. Okay? It just begins to change. And Garbhati's tusk, right? He has one broken tooth, one full. Another meaning to that is science is limited. Our vision is limited. We only see what we're able to see through our eyes. I don't see x-rays, right? I can't see infrared light. But is that a reality? Does that exist? We go to a doctor, we get x-rays, right? So it's a reality, but I can't see it. Does that mean it doesn't exist? No. So what I see is an illusion. Not because reality is an illusion, but because I'm limited. And so science and all the different ways of science are based on observation. Using what? Using tools that we have. And what are those tools? Our eyes, our ears. And we can enhance those through machines and robotics and computers and things like that. But what is it? It's another aspect of ourself, enhanced. But they're still limited. What's not limiting? Love. Does love have any limits? No. So, Bhakti Yoga talks of love, devotion. Thank you. So these are paths. Okay? Neither of them is wrong. We need both. We need to have a good understanding of what's around us. Because we do have this body, and until I'm living, I need to protect it. I need to take good care of it. Okay? Now, I consider this to be a disciplined freedom. We talk of freedom that I want to do anything I want, whenever I want, however I want, with whoever I want. Okay? But if my leg is broken, am I free? If I'm deaf, am I limited? Doesn't mean I can't do anything, but any part of my body that's not full and complete and whole and healthy is going to lead to some kind of difficulty and limit my freedom. So what about my thoughts? Okay, if, I, if those are limited, no, right? So in order for me to expand myself into myself, I need to be open-minded. I need to be able to learn from each other, learn from nature. 
there's learning that can happen all around. Okay? I can learn from my experience to say, you know what, I fell down, but why did I fall? Okay, next time I'm going to avoid that. All right? If I know something is coming up in front of me, there's a big ditch in the road, I can go around it. Okay? Learn from water. Water, nature, right? Water. Uh, give me some properties of water. Yeah. Ice. Okay. Water vapor. Okay. Uh, what are the three stages of water? Um, solid, liquid, and gas. Right. So water can behave as a liquid, solid, or gas. Now, let's talk about the liquid part of water. All right. Um, you have it in a bottle in front of you, right? What shape does that water have? The shape of the bottle? Yeah. What if you put it in a different square bottle? What shape will the water have? It will change into that shape. Right. Thank you. Right? So does water have its own shape? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. It changes into the shape that is. Right. So it's fluid. Right? Wherever it is, it can take that form. Okay? You can create any, any kind of form, any bottle you want, pour water in it, and it'll take that shape. And then what if you freeze it? It'll hold that shape, right? So that's a quality of water. Now, if water is flowing in a river or in a stream, what if there is rock in the middle? What does the water do? Does it stop and say, oh, no, I'm stuck? What does water do? It just passes through to find any empty space that it can go through. Exactly. So does the water's flow stop? No. No, it just goes around, right? If it's small enough, it just goes over it, right? It doesn't stop. And so, we have difficulties we'll face in our life all the time. What does that mean? It's a way we look at it, right? I can say, okay, I'm stuck, or I can say that's an opportunity, or I can say, all right, it's just part of life. Just go around it, go over it, find a way. And there's always a way, right? Water always finds its way. Sometimes you have a leak in the house, and you think, Okay, it's leaking here, so there must be a hole over here. And then you realize the hole is on the other side of the house, and it's traveled its way down and leaked somewhere else, right? So water always finds its way around to where it needs to go, right? So Bruce Lee was saying, be like water, flexible and fluid, but at the same time it can turn to ice, be very strong and powerful, right? So it can be used as a weapon. And so what's happening? So we're learning from nature, we can do the same. We can also be flexible. So in times of difficulty, be flexible, be fluid, work around it, okay? figure out ways. And that's where intelligence comes in. So we talk about Ganapati, Ganesh, right? Be a leader in your own life. You don't need to have a leader of society, leader of you know, governments, nations. There's a leader in your home. There's a leader in your life. And who is that? You are, right? So you are your own leader in your own life. Okay, there are other leaders you can learn from. We can learn from each other, and that's great. But don't forget, you need to choose your own things. And for that, learning, education is very key. It's very important, right? And that's why we do things like this. We learn from each other. We educate ourselves. The more I know, the better choices I can make. So, if I want to make a better choice, well, how can I make that if I don't know? Right? Yeah. Thank you. So, can you read uh, number four out of there? Those who have restrained all the senses are even minded in all conditions, engaged in welfare of all beings they come in. They also come unto me. Okay. So, that was the second part, right? That's the Gnan Yoga. So there's a sect of people that follow the path of Gnan Yoga. And they're talking about that even Krishna Bhagavan is saying, those will also ultimately reach me. So he's not negating that path. He's saying the path may be more difficult, but ultimately they also reach me. Let's look at the next one. So here is the path of those whose minds are set on the manifest. For the goal of the unmanifest, unmanifest is painful to reach by the imbibed beings. Okay. So there's a word in there that says unmanifest. Can anyone tell me what that means? 
you can't see. Okay? How about you? What does unmanifest mean? Okay. Something you cannot see? You could feel it? Okay. Anybody else? What is unmanifest? You can define it. Okay. Yeah. It's an illusion. Okay. That's a good one to think of, right? So unmanifest. Manifest means to take form, to take shape. Okay. So unmanifest is one without a form, without a shape. Right? Now, can you think of someone that has no shape, no form? No color, no sound. Space. Space. Okay. Can you think of space? Yeah. Tell me what you're thinking of. What do you see? There's no boundaries. No boundaries. Okay. Now, if you think of... No end. Yes. Right. So you can describe it. Right. You can describe it. But can you see it? No. It's unmanifest. Right. So, if you cannot see, now our mind is geared towards being able to focus on something, right? If I say, think of something, right? You'll think of something. Something has to be in front of you to be able to focus on it, to think about it, to learn it, right? But reality doesn't have to have form, doesn't have to have shape, okay? So, empty space, right? And you can say it's unending, there's no beginning, there's no end. And we can describe but it's hard to visualize, right? So, because it's hard to visualize it, Krishna Bhagavan says, it's a difficult path, not everybody can follow it, so it's not meant for everyone to follow, but yes, that's another path that can be taken to reach unto me, and ultimately, anyone following that path will reach unto me, right? What's the next slok? How about, can you read that one? We're at, what's slok number? Six. Can you read Slok 6? This is chapter 12 in Bhagavad Gita. We're looking at Slok 6. Say a little loud so everyone can hear you. But those who are solely devoted to me and, sur and surrender, surrendering all actions to me, worship me, the manifest divine, meditating on me with single-minded devotion. Okay, what do you think that means? What is Krishna Bhagavan saying? I think you need to read the next one after that, right? To get the full thing. Yeah, go ahead. Say it again. I like the devotees uh, do everything to Krishna. Okay. Yeah. He's saying that um, there's like um, another group of people who um, sacrifice um, their everything for um, God and they're devoted to Him. Okay. Okay, all right. So let me ask you a question. So there, it's talking about bhakti yoga, right? Love, devotion. So can I just forget everything and just say, you know what, I love the iPhone. I don't care about anything. I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to rest my teeth, I won't take a bath. Okay, I won't read, I won't study. I have the iPhone, I'm just going to play with the iPhone all day. Okay, how about that? Is that good? No. No. Why not? Because... Well, if you play with it all day, you need to eat something and you need to, like, take a break for a couple minutes because then um, you might get, um, pass out. Okay. So you're still living, right? So you still need to kind of do your basic stuff, right? <laughs> you need to eat, you need to clean your body, things like that. Okay. So anything else? Any other thoughts on that? So Krishna Bhagavan is giving two paths, right? One is Bhakti Yoga, one is Gnana Yoga. Now, those aren't the only options, but that's what we're reading so far, right? But is it not ironical that you can't have bhakti without the jnana? There you go, okay? So, it's not one or the other, okay? Now, when we're reading, if I want to understand something, okay, um, I'm going to focus on that one thing. But, does that mean that one thing is the full reality? 
Mm -hmm. so, so as a scientist, I might look in a magnifying glass. I might look at a scope to kind of zoom in on something really small, tiny, that I can't see with my eyes to see what's happening. But that tiny thing is inside a bigger thing, right? That cell is a part of my body. And so I can understand the cell. I can break the cell down into all its different parts and pieces. I can understand the functionality of all the different parts of the cell. Okay? So I'm beginning to understand something of myself because this cell is a part of me. It's what makes my body. But is that me? Is that my body? No. It's a part of me. So when we're learning, we need to break things down. Okay? We have a ruler. We look at mile, right? There's a mile, let's say, form of distance, right? We measure things with milliliters and liters and gallons and things like that. In reality, who made this up? Who said this is a gallon? People. People. Why? They use like evidence and stuff to figure out how much is like how much is liter, how much is two liters. Okay. And they use like. Okay. So what if what if um, you said this bottle is one liter, okay? And what if you said no, can't be a liter. This book is a liter, okay? And what if you said no, 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 this jacket is a liter, okay? Or is everybody in agreement? No. So if you're all studying the same subject and you want to measure it and understand it, and if you all have different definition of what that is. Will you be able to explain to each other what you're doing? No. So there's an established standard that we all agree upon, and it's made up. We made it up. Okay? We all accept that, yep, yeah, we're going to say this amount is a liter. This amount is a foot. Once we have that acceptance, now we can use that measure to measure different things around us, to kind of understand it. But that measurement is a made-up thing. Why? Because we need that. Reality is as it is. It doesn't need anything. It's just there. We're just here. In order to understand ourselves, our surroundings, we need to measure. And so I can kind of get an understanding. Oh, he's taller than he is. I have to do some kind of measurement, some kind of understanding. And maybe that means something. Oh, wait a minute. You're taller today than you were a month ago. Oh, that means you're growing. Okay? So to understand reality, we break things down. To understand reality, we break things down and use measurements to be able to do that. Now, Bhakti Yoga, Gnan Yoga, these are different paths. Okay? But as a person, can you go from one to the other? Sure you can. Right? Now, as you're doing something because you love someone, you're going to want to know more about them. Right? Because you love them, you want to know everything. So what is knowing? Yeah. Yeah. Knowledge. And the path you take towards it is Gnan Yoga. Right? Now I'm kind of simplifying this, but to get an understanding of what does this big word mean? Now if I gave you a word and nobody heard it before, does that word have any value to you? No. Because you don't know what it means. Okay? If I tell you to guess, everybody might guess what the word is, but still there's no value to it because it's not understood and it's not common amongst each other, right? And that's where symbols come in. So word, language, is symbolism. We're incorporating and accepting with each other that yes, this word means this. And if we all accept that, now we just create a language. And we're talking right now in English, we all understand in English because we all learned what those words meant. We went to kindergarten, high school, college, and so on, right? So, we're learning this thing. The same way we need to learn and understand symbols within our own life, okay? Not just because, oh, we have these great saints and sages and they gave us these symbols, so I need to know what they are. No, we need to be able to take the next step and incorporate it into our practice, into our life. Because then that symbol has real value, right? Great. Let's read, uh, you can read the next one. Number seven. Yes, uh, number seven. Those whose minds are set on me, O oh, Arjuna, 
I speedily rescue from the ocean of death from existence. Okay. Um, can you let's see what else? Yeah. Um, can I say what it means? Yeah, sure. Um, Go ahead. I think it means that um, like whoever um, whoever like sacrifices themselves for God, like he can like help them. Like for example, if they're dying from um, they're dying in the ocean, then he can um, help them survive. Okay. How about you? Can you read it another time, loud? Okay, so let's break that up a little bit. Let's read that first line again. These whose minds are set on me, oh, Okay, so those whose minds are set on me. Okay, so what do you think that means? Okay, right, so he's talking about bhakti yoga, right? So love. So if your mind is set on me, and all you're doing is now based on me, based on God, right? So then, what does he say? If your mind is set on me, then what happens? I speedily rescue from the ocean of death and existence. Okay, so let's understand that. Uh, what do you think that means? I speedily rescue you from, death, uh, ocean, from the ocean of death-bound existence. So you don't have to, I mean, I will take care of you. Okay. And will uh, rescue you and will take care of you from all the uh, difficulties okay. of oceans. So well, you're freeing your soul from this uh, real world sort of world, like this kind of world, it will be a spiritual world or something. Okay. How about what do you think it could be? It's, it's kind of immortal. Okay. Because you, will, you don't need to be take birth. Okay. Suffer. So all right. that's a mukti. Mukti. Okay. So what do you think it means? Whatever you do, without expecting any result, without expecting any result, right. uh, then uh, I am the person who can give the result to you. But okay. don't expect that. Don't expect it. You won't have any disappointments. Very good. So what you just mentioned is a very key factor of love, right? I have no right to think about the result. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so that's a very important part of love. When you love someone, Whatever you do, you do it for them, right? You're not expecting anything back in return, okay? You did something because you know your mom loves it. You did something because you know this person loves that. And you did everything you could. You spent five hours, stayed up all night to do that. Just to see the smile in their face, right? And nothing else. They give you a hug and you're happy. Did you expect anything in return? No, you didn't even think, hey, if I do this, I'm gonna get something back in return. Now, what if you thought that way? What if you thought, you know, if I do this for this person, then I'm going to get something back in return. Is that true love? That's not love. So if you're doing something out of love, then that act is a selfless act, right? I'm not expecting anything in return. Thank you. So I'm not expecting anything in return. And Krishna Bhagavan says the second line, that those who follow this, can you say it again? What does he do? Those who follow this? I'll rescue you. Rescue, rescue you, you from the ocean, ocean of ocean death. Death bound, yes. death bound existence, right? So there's life and death. We're born, we're going to die. And that's a cycle that repeats, right? So it's going to be living, you're going to die, you're going to live, you're going to die. Uh, and he'll take you away from that. Now, how does that happen? Does it really matter to me? All I know is this moment. I know I'm living now because I think I'm living. Okay, some reason, I'm alive. One day I'll die. What happens after that? I don't know. Okay, but there's something value there. What's the value? The value is, if I'm living in this moment, and what I'm doing is out of love, it's selfless act, then all my worries are gone. Am I worrying about tomorrow? Am I worrying about yesterday? All my focus is in that one aspect. This is what I'm doing because I'm doing it out of love. And so my worries disappear. My stress disappears. My nervousness is gone, right? My hunger is gone. All my focus is on someone other than myself. 
And that love leads my entire act. And through that action, learning happens. So I become knowledgeable. I gain knowledge and wisdom out of doing, out of action. And that action is out of love. And so all my worries, all my tension, all my stress disappears. It's fate. So I'm doing for this, and He'll take care of me. Right? God will take care of me. So yes, that's there. But the practicality is what's happening. My stress levels are down. If I had blood pressure, back to normal. Right? My eating, sleeping, everything. Okay? Just happens. I'm not worried about it. I don't have to plan it. I don't have to do it. I'm doing whatever I'm doing in the form of love. And so that's one small aspect, one small understanding from me about Bhakti Yoga and Chapter 12 so far. Thank you.